tonight's talk and the next three nights uh, will be on the five aggregates. Uh, and I will read certain suttas from the Sangyutta Nikaya concerning the five aggregates of attachment uh, and then try to explain it. Uh. These five aggregates of attachment uh, is one of the very important topics uh, in the Dhamma. Because probably the most important topic in the Dhamma is the four Aryan truths, the four noble truths. And inside the four noble truths, uh, the first truth about suffering, the definition of suffering or dukkha is given as follows. Uh, being born is dukkha. Aging is dukkha. Dying is dukkha. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair are dukkha. Association with the dislike is dukkha. Separation from the light is dukkha. Not getting what one wants is dukkha. In brief, the five aggregates of attachment are dukkha. So in this definition of dukkha, suffering or unsatisfactoriness of life, huh? Um, it is mentioned that briefly yeah, the five aggregates of attachment are dukkha. So if you want to understand dukkha, you should uh, understand the five aggregates of attachment. And so understanding that uh, we can reduce or eliminate our dukkha. What is these five aggregates of attachment? Pali word for it eh, is pancha upadana kanda. Consists of three words. Pancha, as some of you would know, is five. Upadana is attachment. Kanda can be translated as aggregates. So, pancha upadana kanda can be translated as the five aggregates of attachment. And the key word here eh, is attachment. Uh, attachment, uh, because of attachment to the five aggregates, uh, suffering arises. And why does attachment come about? Because uh, we have a perception of a self, an I, and a mind in the five aggregates. Uh. And these five aggregates are, the first one is body, Second one is feeling, third one is perception, fourth is volition, the fifth is consciousness. The last four can be grouped together as mind, M-I-N-D. And the first one is body. So this basically the five aggregates are body and mind. It is not Nama Rupa, this is body and mind. It is the five aggregates that are body and mind. Later, uh, as we read the suttas, uh, we will understand uh, that Nama Rupa is slightly different. So, because of a perception of an I and mind in the five aggregates, uh, attachment comes about. And with attachment, uh, suffering comes about. For example, if you hear either in the papers or from your neighbor, huh, that somebody's son was killed in an accident, you would probably not grieve, huh, because that person huh, you don't consider to be yours or anything to do with uh, yours, your possession. But if someone came and told you, just now when your son came back from a school, he was knocked down by a car and he died, what would happen? He would be immediately eh, struck by this news eh, and he would probably burst into tears and cry very loudly perhaps grieve unbearably and perhaps for a fairly long time. 
on the other hand, as I mentioned just now, if you read in the papers, for example, during the Kongsi Raya festival, a whole family got killed in a car accident. To you, that is just news. You are not much affected by it. But if your own son is killed, then you suffer quite unbearably. And this is because of attachment, the perception of an I and a mind. Similarly, you know, this uh, period uh, is a period where there's an economic recession. So, in the next few months, uh, you are likely to read news about people going bankrupt. But if you read news about people going bankrupt, uh, it would not affect you very much because it is somebody else getting bankrupt. But if your own business went bankrupt, uh, then you might grieve. Eh? And as happened to some people, they might even commit suicide. Eh? Yeah. So, uh, the problem here is attachment, and which comes from a perception of an I and a mind. And this mind eh, can extend eh, from my family, my property, to those of my same race, to those of my same religion, to those of my same country, my countrymen. And this leads to quarrels, fights, uh, and even wars. uh. Uh. So because of that, uh, we have to understand why is it that the five khandhas, the five aggregates, uh, body and mind basically, gives you a perception of an eye and a mind. And the suttas, the discourses of the Buddha, uh, are basically to help us to see uh, that there is no I and mind in these five aggregates. And if we can see that there is no I and mind in the five aggregates, uh, then slowly we let go of our attachment uh, to the five aggregates. Now, how is it that we have a perception of a uh, I and a mind, uh, or a self, uh, in the five aggregates. The first one is the body. Uh, We all know uh, you have a body, every one of us has a body. And if our body is short, you say, I am short. If the body is beautiful, you say, I am beautiful. If the body is sick, you say, I am sick. Uh, So you can see uh, how easily we associate the body with the self. Mm. The second one is feeling. When happy feeling arises, uh, you say, I am happy. When angry feeling arises, you say, I am angry. And when sorrowful feelings arise, you say, I suffer, I grieve. Uh. So, again, uh, we easily associate feelings with the self. And the third one is perception. Perception means uh, you have a certain perception or conception of something. In the suttas, the Buddha mentioned, uh, like the colors, uh, you have a perception that this is yellow. uh, And you have a perception of some other colors. But somebody else uh, might not perceive... uh, this to be yellow, they might uh, have a different opinion from you. Especially, for example, if somebody wears uh, dark glasses and you ask him what color it is, uh, he might swear uh, this is a certain color. But when he removes the dark glasses, then he realizes it's a different color. So perceptions are not very reliable. For example, you perceive that a certain man is very handsome. Somebody else might not perceive that that man is handsome. Similarly, you perceive that some lady is beautiful, but it might not be, she might not be beautiful to someone else. Or you perceive that somebody is a very nice person, but he might not appear nice to his enemy. Uh, So perceptions are also... uh, as we said, uh, not reliable. And the fourth is volition. Volition because we 
uh, because of the nature of our thought process, eh, when a consciousness arises, for example, you see a person in front of you, and that seeing consciousness eh, gives rise to a feeling, a feeling that this is a nice uh, feeling you get, eh, for example, because that sight that you see is a beautiful sight, it's a beautiful girl or a handsome man. Eh? And then after that, perception arises. And then after that, uh, you perceive that this person is very appealing. Uh, the looks are very appealing. Then the volition arises. You might decide there is a decision uh, in the mind that you like to speak to this person. So that decision in the mind that arises, uh, that volition, you perceive also to be yourself making that decision. I want to talk to her. Uh, so uh, you can see also how easily we associate uh, volition with the self. And lastly, consciousness. Consciousness meaning seeing consciousness, hearing consciousness, smelling consciousness, tasting, touch and thinking consciousness. And if the sound comes to your ear and you have a good ear, the hearing consciousness arises. And when you pay attention to it, you note the sound. So straight away eh, you have this perception or this uh, once you have that consciousness of that hearing, you feel that I hear eh, that I arises with the normal consciousness. Lah. So these are the ways uh, in which we associate the five aggregates uh, with an I and a mind or a self. Now I'll go into some of the suttas uh, in uh, read some of the suttas uh, because it explains more clearly uh, the Buddha's teachings. I feel it is very important always uh, that we refer to the suttas because the words of the Buddha are always better than any one of us. However well we try to explain eh, the Buddha's teachings, we can never explain them as well as the Buddha. So first we have to rely on the Buddha's words. And only when certain points are not so clear, then we try to clarify the points. That's why I feel eh, it is always best eh, to teach from the suttas. The first sutta I like to Explain is from the Sangyutta Nikaya, Sutta number 22.79. Now all these, uh, most of the suttas and the five khandhas are found in the third volume of the Sangyutta Nikaya. And in the third volume of the Sangyutta Nikaya, the first chapter is a chapter number 22, the 22nd Sangyutta, and it deals with the five aggregates like wow. in fact the uh, the two most important nikayas uh, out of the four original nikayas are the Sangyutta nikaya and the anguttara nikaya because there you have most of the discourses of the buddha the Sangyutta nikaya amounts to about 2000 slightly over 2000 discourses and the anguttara nikaya also amounts to over 2000 discourses now in Sangyutta Nikaya 22.79, the Buddha said, Whatsoever recluses or Brahmins, monks, remember their diverse former lives. In so doing, all of them remember the five aggregates of attachment, or one or other of these five aggregates. He says, Of such and such a body was I in time past, says one. And so remembering, it is body monks that he thus remembers. I felt thus and thus, says he, and in so remembering, it is feeling that he thus remembers. Thus and thus I perceived, says he, and in so remembering, it is perception that he thus remembers. Thus and thus in conditioning was I, says he, and in thus remembering, it is the conditioner Conditioners that he thus remembers. Thus and thus conscious was I, says he, 
And in so remembering, it is consciousness that he remembers. I just stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is saying uh, that whenever we refer to ourselves in a past life, we always refer to the five aggregates because we always uh, associate these five aggregates with yourself, with ourself. The fourth one here uh, is uh, conditioning. It is the conditioners that he remembers because the Pali word is Sankara and Sankara in the suttas, uh, can be translated as conditioners. Sometimes some people use the word condition things, but uh, there is another word for condition things, and that is sankata. Sankata. And sankara is slightly different. Sankara is that which conditions something else. All things in the world uh, depend on conditions, they arise and pass away uh, according to conditions. So, for example, uh, A might arise uh, due to certain conditioners it arises. And after it has arisen, it causes B, for example, to arise later or simultaneously. So A is the conditioner of B and B is the condition. But then B, even though it is the condition, Later, it conditions something else, say C. So, B becomes the conditioner of C. And later, C becomes a conditioner of something else. So, in a way, things in the world are conditioners as well as condition. But from the suttas, we see that the word conditioner is more, is better translated as uh, the Sankara is better translated as conditioner. And later we can see, uh, as far as the, as the five aggregates are concerned, the Sankara is uh, a definite form of conditioner, and that is volition. And that we can see in the Sutta later. Uh, and the Buddha continues. And why, monks, do you say body? One is affected, monks. That is why body is used. Affected by what? Affected by touch of cold and heat, of hunger and thirst, of gnats, mosquitoes, wind and sun and snakes. One is affected, monks. That is why you say body. i just stop here for a moment. This one, uh, affected, uh, uh, is related to the word bo- uh, uh, body, which is rupa, la. Uh, and affected, uh, meaning rupati. Uh, so, uh, because the word affected uh, is rupati, so the word rupa uh, comes from the fact that body is affected by conditions. Uh. And the Buddha continues, And why monks do you say feeling? One feels monks. That is why feeling is used. Feels what? Feels pleasure and pain. Feels neutral feelings. One feels monks. That is why the word feeling is used. And why monks do you say perception? One perceives monks. That is why the word perception is used. Perceives what? Perceives blue, green. Perceives yellow or red or white. One perceives monks. That is why the word perception is used. And why monks do you say conditioner, sankara? They condition the conditioned. That monks is why they are called the conditioners. And what is the condition that they condition? Body as body is the condition that they condition. Feeling as feeling is the condition that they condition. Perception as perception is the condition that they condition. Conditioner as conditioner is the condition that they condition. That is why the word conditioner, sankara, is used. And why, monks, do you say consciousness? One is conscious or one cognizes, monks. Therefore, the word consciousness is used. Conscious of what? Of flavors, sour or bitter, acrid or sweet, alkaline or non-alkaline, saline or non-saline. One is conscious, monks. That is why the word consciousness is used. I think this is... uh, fairly self-evident, so 
Uh, I don't think I'll explain. The next sutta is Sanghita Nikaya 22.122. Once the Venerable Sariputta and the Venerable Maha Kotita were staying at Banares in Isi Patana in the Deer Park. Then the Venerable Maha Kotita, rising in the evening from his solitude, came to the Venerable Sariputta and thus addressed him. I'll just stop here for a moment. We find in the suttas eh, that uh, the daily life of the monks during the Buddha's time was that they go for arms round in the morning. They go and gather their food. And then coming back from arms round, they eat the food either in the monastery or they go into the forest to eat their food. And after eating their food, they take some rest. And then the rest of the day, they sit in meditation. Later, when the sun set, they would come together, they would come to the most senior monk and discuss Dhamma. Discussion of Dhamma was very important during the Buddha's time. Now, whether the monks were already Arahants or they were not yet Arahants, still they come together to discuss the Dhamma. So here the Venerable Maha Kotita came to, to see the Venerable Sariputta and addressed him. Avuso Sariputta. Avuso is sometimes translated as reverend or friend. What are the conditions, Dhamma, that should be thoroughly pondered by a virtuous monk? And the Venerable uh, Sariputta answered, the five aggregates of attachment, friend, kotita, are the conditions which should be thoroughly pondered by a virtuous monk as being impermanent, as suffering, as a disease, as a tumor, as a dart, as a calamity, as an affliction, as alien, as disintegrating, as empty, as not self. What five aggregates? The aggregate of body, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness. By a virtuous monk, friend Kotita, these five aggregates of attachment should be thoroughly pondered. Indeed, friend, it is possible for a virtuous monk so thoroughly pondering these five aggregates of attachment to realize the fruits of stream winning. i just stop here for a moment. So, here, Venerable Sariputta is saying uh, that an uh, ordinary monk, uh, a putujana monk, if he uh, contemplates uh, the five aggregates of attachment, uh, it is possible for him to realize sotapanna. Uh, stream winning. Now, the Venerable Sariputta said uh, that uh, a monk uh, should contemplate uh, the five aggregates uh, with these following characteristics. This is quite important here. As being impermanent, as suffering, as a disease, as a tumor, as a dart, as a calamity, an affliction, as alien, as disintegrating, as empty, as not self. The first one, impermanent, I think you all can know eh, the impermanent nature of the body, of feelings, perception, volition, consciousness. As suffering, as suffering because if we attach to them, eh, they give us suffering. For example, the body. The body, uh, because of its impermanent nature, eh, will grow will grow old. And when the body grows old, eh, uh, some people don't like to grow old. And then they lament over the fact that they are growing old. And if they are attached to the body, then they would suffer. They, they are unhappy. Eh? They are growing older and older, looking uglier and uglier. Uh, and also, if worse still, eh, if the body one day were to die, either their own body or, for example, their child's body eh, were to die, then if they attach to it, eh, then it gives them suffering. So it's a source of suffering. 
as a disease uh, because it is liable to sickness, uh, uh, this uh, kind of disease. Uh, and also, if you have too much attachment, uh, for example, to feelings, uh, if you, you, you want to have uh, pleasant feelings uh, and you are too attached to pleasant feelings, uh, then it is a kind of sickness. Uh, for example, like sensual desire. Uh, sensual desire arises because of uh, uh, the pleasure that arises from body. Uh, so if you are too much attached to sensual desire, then it is a kind of disease lah, where you try to satisfy this uh, uh, desire and you go to uh, quite out of your way eh, to try to satisfy this desire, then it becomes a sickness, a disease. As a tumor, tumor or cancer, lah. Uh, we don't need a doctor to tell us eh, that we have cancer. All of us have cancer because uh, any time eh, we can die. Uh, we have a very limited lifespan. On the average, we live up to 70. So, um, since the body is going to die, yeah, and we don't even know when it is going to die, it is as though we have cancer. Like. As a dart, as a dart, it's like an arrow that pokes you. Like. Uh, the five aggregates, our body and our mind, uh, gives us suffering. And the body gives you bodily suffering. The mind gives you mental suffering. And some people, if they use their mind too much, huh, they have a lot of mental suffering. Uh-huh. That's why, like two years ago when I was in Australia, I found a lot of white Australians, they like to meditate. Not that they are interested in Buddhism. At first, huh, they come in because they have a lot of mental suffering, because they use their mind too much. So they want to ease their mental suffering, they want to come and learn meditation. Later, if they make some progress in the meditation, then they become interested in Buddhism and they come to listen to the Dhamma. And slowly, after listening to the Dhamma, they might say that they have become a Buddhist. Uh, So as a calamity, as a calamity, because uh, any time we can uh, pass away, uh, it is... uh, source of suffering eh? as an affliction this is like a sickness la, as alien this alien is quite interesting the Buddha is telling us eh, that the five aggregates the body and the mind is something like alien external to us <clears throat> this we might be able to understand eh, if we meditate eh, and our mind becomes calmer and calmer and calmer as our mind becomes calmer and calmer and more tranquil, we go deeper and deeper into our mind. As we go deeper and deeper into our mind, uh, slowly the body begins to fade away. The body begins to fade away from us. And the mind also begins to fade away from us uh, as we go deeper and deeper into ourselves. And slowly the whole world begins to fade away from us. And then we realize that this body and this mind and all this world uh, is as though alien to us, uh, external to us as we go deeper and deeper into our mind. As disintegrating, as something that is breaking up. uh, We know that the body is breaking up. uh, As empty. Empty, why? There is no uh, essence uh, in the body and the mind. Later you will find some similes eh, for the five khandhas that the Buddha gave. Eh, and you can see eh, how apt it is. Lah. For example, the body is made up of cells. Millions and millions of cells. And these cells are arising and passing away. Arising and passing away. No two moments eh, are, is the body the same. And every seven years, according to scientists, eh, our, the cells in our body eh, are completely changed every seven years. So that's this body that you're carrying about with you now is completely different from the body you were having seven years ago. Just imagine, eh, this body that you have eh, is completely different from the body you had seven years ago. And as the cells in our body die and we shed them, eh, in a way we are like a snake. 
you know, a snake, uh, every now and then it's got to change its skin. Why? Because it has to grow in size. As it grows in size, uh, uh, then the, the, the skin uh, is no more suitable for it, so it starts to shed the, the, the skin. And then uh, it throws away the skin and then it grows a new skin which is slightly bigger so that it can accommodate itself. So in the same way, we are slowly shedding ourselves uh, uh, part by part uh, and slowly over seven years we completely change all our, the whole body. So you can see uh, uh, that the body, uh, uh, because it consists of all these cells, uh, it is of the nature of emptiness. In fact, later, if I go into this more in detail, then you will understand it even better. Or in fact, I can go into it now. Why is this uh, uh, empty? Eh? Because uh, besides these cells, eh, when you look into these cells, what do you find? In every cell, eh, you have atoms, right? Cells are made up of atoms. Eh? Perhaps a whole lot of atoms, I don't know how many in each cell, eh? that, but there will be a lot of atoms. So basically, our whole body eh, is made up of billions and billions of atoms. Right? And you know, every atom uh, is a huge void uh, in which uh, particles of energy are moving to and fro. Right? Particles of energy are moving to and fro. Just like you look into the sky at night. When you look into the sky at night, you find that most of the space, uh, outer space, uh, is empty. Except for some stars and planets here and there. Right? Uh, you could say that 99.9999999% of it is empty. Uh, so in the same way, every cell in our body, 99.9999, sorry, every atom in our body, 99.9999999% of the, em- of the atom is empty. In other words, our body, which is made up of all these atoms, is no different from the air around us. No different from the air around us. And because it is no different from the air around us, eh, the Buddha and his Arahan disciples, eh, they understanding this knowledge, they can walk through walls and all that. Anyway, this is a different matter. So, this this body, which is 99.99999% eh, is actually empty. And formerly, eh, uh, scientists uh, they did not understand this, uh, but now it appears that scientists uh, are beginning to understand uh, that this 99.999999% emptiness is not really empty, but it is consciousness. Consciousness. And because of that, uh, uh, our mind uh, affects our whole body. Uh, in other words, we are consciousness. Uh, uh, and whatever you think uh, affects your whole body. Uh, that is why mind is so powerful. Uh, mind uh, is that uh, which we try to understand in the Buddha's teachings. So how is it that we see ourselves as a human body? The Buddha says because we are dreaming. Uh, the consciousness, uh, because of karma, the consciousness makes you see yourself as a solid human being with a head, two hands, two feet. Uh, another day, if you work uh, some evil karma and you pass away from this life, uh, then your consciousness will see, make you see yourself perhaps as an animal mm-hmm. walking on all fours uh, with a tail. Uh, so that is why later we find in the suttas, the Buddha said, uh, consciousness is like a conjurer. It conj- uh, conjures up uh, a magic show. One lifetime after another lifetime is like a magic show. You see yourself as one person and then that dream ends and then another dream begins and you see another lifetime uh, before you. Uh, so from this you can see uh, how the five aggregates uh, are empty. Lah. And then the last one is not self. It's not self. Uh, uh, this not self, anatta, um, means uh, there is no abiding, there is no thing uh, that is unchanging uh, in the body and the mind. This body and the mind is always changing in a state of flux. Uh, that is why there is no 
something uh, that is permanent, unchanging. That is why the Buddha says it is not self. Lah. Sometimes this word anatta is translated as non-self. Uh, but I think probably not self is more accurate. Lah. Now the uh, sutta continues. Uh, Mahakotita asking the Venerable Sariputta again. But, friend Sariputta, what are the things that should be thoroughly pondered by a monk who is a stream winner? And Venerable Sariputta said, By a monk who is a stream winner, friend Kotita, it is these same five aggregates of attachment that should be so pondered. Indeed, friend, it is possible for a monk who is a stream winner by so pondering these five aggregates of attachment to realize the fruits of one's returning Sakadagamin, which means a second fruition. But friend Sariputta, what are the things that should be thoroughly pondered by a monk who is a once returner Sakadagamin? By one who is a once returner, friend Kotita, it is these same five aggregates of attachment that should be thoroughly pondered. Indeed, it is possible, friend, for one who is a once returner by so pondering to realize the fruits of non-returning anagamin, third fruition. But friend Sariputta, what are the things that should be thoroughly pondered by one who is a non-returner anagamin? And Venerable Sariputta answered, By such a one, friend Kotita, it is these same five aggregates of attachment that should be so pondered. It is possible, friend, for a non-returner, Anagamin, by so pondering to realize the fruits of Arahanship, that is the fourth fruition. But what, friend, but what, friend Sariputta, are the things that should be thoroughly pondered by one who is Arahan? By an arahan, friend Kotita, these five aggregates of attachment should be thoroughly pondered as being impermanent, as suffering, as a disease, as a tumor, as a dart, as a calamity, as an affliction, as disintegrating, as empty, as not self. For the arahan, friend, there is nothing further to be done, nor is there return to upheaping of what is done. Nevertheless, these things, if practiced and developed, conduce to a happy existence and to self-possession even in this present life. That is the end of the sutta. So, in the, in the last part of the sutta that I've read, eh, the Venerable, the Arahan Sariputta is saying eh, that uh, in the whole sutta, the, uh, the Arahan Sariputta is saying that if a uh, Monk is a putujana, an ordinary monk. If he contemplates on the five aggregates, uh, it is possible he attains the first fruition. And a first fruition monk should also ponder, uh, contemplate on the five aggregates. And in so doing, uh, he can attain the second fruition, Sakadagamin. And a sec second fruition monk uh, should also ponder on the five aggregates. Uh, so that he can attain the third fruition. And the third fruition monk should also ponder on the five aggregates to attain the fourth fruition, Arahanhood. And so you can see uh, how important the five aggregates are so that at every stage uh, of the Aryan path, uh, uh, the, the person uh, should ponder on these uh, five aggregates.